Today, I'm excited to welcome Angie, an expert in e-commerce whose journey went from nursing to a multi-million dollar kids brand to an e-com agency owner. Angie shares the roller coaster of emotions and challenges she faced transitioning from a demanding nursing career to an e commerce entrepreneur to someone who is now working with multiple brands to help them scale their stores. Her story is a powerful testament to the transformative power of pursuing a passion, leveraging gaps in the market, and the remarkable impact of embracing social media to skyrocket business growth. Join us as Angie dives deep into her e-commerce journey, offering invaluable insights and actionable advice for inspiring entrepreneurs looking to make their mark in the digital world. Whether you're a seasoned e-commerce veteran or just starting, this episode is packed with strategies, lessons learned, and a generous dose of inspiration to fuel your entrepreneurial dreams. Let's get into it. Hey, Angie, thank you so much for coming on the show today. It's a pleasure to have you on. I know from our experience, you're going to bring a lot of value today to our listeners. So uh, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. So before we get into the value that you'll bring today, um, why don't we give everybody just an overview of like who you are and how you got started in e-com? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Hopefully you guys have some time. So um, I have been in, D- in the e-commerce space for about eight years now. Um, this all started uh, back in 2015, 16. I was pregnant with my daughter. I was a full-time nurse working you know, 12, 13-hour shifts, and uh, I just didn't want to do that anymore. Um, so sorry if there's any nurses listening. I give you guys so much respect. Um, I did it for four years and it was just so hard on me and my body. And, um, I just wanted to find something that I could enjoy doing and spend more time with my kids. Um, so I, uh, stumbled upon, you know, uh, some voids in the market when it came to shopping for kids. And I decided that I wanted to start a kid's boutique. Um, I started off by just testing the market and identifying some you know, cute prints and, and, you know, silhouettes that I could find and resell for, uh, an affordable price just to kind of read and and see what moms wanted. Uh, and fast forward, you know, four and a half years later, we, uh, turned that into a huge success. It was, a uh, we actually grew to 1.7 million within 18 months of launching. Wow. Um, and I was able to afford, you know, to leave my nursing career and just focus on that full time. We had a warehouse, a team, the whole thing. So, um, I come from both ends, you know, so that started my D to C space. And then I really fell in love with, um, paid social. Um, I was just so fascinated by the data and just like the human psychology behind, you know, the behaviors of buying and what's, you know, triggering people to buy versus what doesn't. And so I really decided uh, during COVID when my factory shut down that it was a pivotal moment for me to kind of shift focus and um, dive into the marketing space full time. Um, And so that's, that's sort of how the journey started. It's really interesting, like starting out, like you said, the nurse background, I think as I've spoken to so many brand owners that it's really just they wanted to find like more fulfillment or time in their life. And that's where it comes in. Of course, we all know the people who have like the genius idea to sell something, but most of it is just a natural progression of yearning for something else. Yes, absolutely. And I think naturally, this is something that's important to me. And when I talk to my clients now, it's like, we are all born like visionaries. Like, Mm -hmm. if you really think about it, like we all have this like incredible idea and we want to see it, you know, come fruition. And so I think by nature, since I was young, I was very, very creative. Mm -hmm. Um, I always like um, found ways to make money off of like my creativeness. Um, and so it was like destined to happen. Um, I never in a million years thought that I would be transitioning into marketing though, full time, uh, which was new to me. Um, interesting. So So let me ask you a couple of questions in in terms of like the, the starting of the e-commerce, um, you know, being a business owner and having kids myself, it's just trying to balance that time and you wanted to spend more time were you ever able to achieve that during the e-commerce brand t- 
time frame? Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, yes and no. So um, I think most people go in with the misconception that if you're an entrepreneur, you'll be able to have more flexible hours and you'll be able to spend more time with your family. And to a certain extent, yes, um, meaning you're in the same room. <laughs> Right. Um, but that's about it. Like your yep. mind is just like elsewhere. And so it has been a bit of a practice for me over the years, even now to make sure that I'm present. Yep. Um, but with my, so I have four kids with Reed, um, my youngest, who's now five. When I had him, I was still running the e brand full time. And I got to keep him with me in the warehouse for eight months. Um, yep. he, he didn't get, you know, he didn't have to go to daycare right out the gate. And so that was nice. I think that was the longest I've ever got to keep one of my kids. It's so sad when you say it out loud, but, um, <laughs> yeah. you yeah. know, like without having to go right back to work. Right. Yeah. I'm, I'm super blessed. My wife has a job where she's able to work from home. So she has our newborn at home, but you know, our two and a half year olds in daycare. It's just one of those things in life. Yes. Um, so for the e brand, you mentioned that, um, Basically, it was a shutdown during COVID that caused that to, can you walk through a little bit of what were some of the steps you took? Because that's really quick growth in a short period of time to 1.7, 1.8 million. Can you walk through for anyone listening who's like maybe at 50K a month, 30K a month, like what yeah. were some of the pivotal steps that you took to get it to that point? Yeah, um, that's a great question. So you have to remember back in 2015, 16, like these were the Facebook days. Like if mm -hmm. you boosted a post, if you, I mean, you really didn't have to have marketing skills to really make an ad work and yeah. <laughs> um, RIP, I miss those days. Yeah. The good old days. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so what, what I did were a few things. So uh, right away, uh, when I first started, um, I had some budget set aside for marketing. I always knew, and I, I even sat on a panel for Facebook when they came to tour in Tampa. And this was my, you know, like when I started this business, I knew that I had to have marketing spend, you know, in order mm -hmm. to support the growth out the gate. Um, so that was always allocated. However, it didn't give me the growth that I was looking for right out, you know, as quickly as I wanted it. So right. we used to do a lot of trade shows, um, in fact, and so, we'd pay as a sponsor to these trade shows and they were, you know, trade shows specifically targeting moms in the area. Mm -hmm. We drive all the way. This is when I lived in Florida. We drive all the way to Tampa. We drive to St. Pete. We drive to Ocala and we would just set up shop for like, you know, two days and um, it crushed. And I wasn't there for like the money. I was there for the community building. Yep. Um, and I don't know if you guys know this or if they do it now, but if you sponsor a trade show, um, they will, they have packages that will provide you the email list of all the attendees. Yep. And so that's how we grew our email list so rapidly, um, uh -oh. is by buying these, uh, these lists essentially. Right. And we knew they were our demographic. So it was like a no brainer. Yep. So our email list grew so quickly. Um, we had thousands of email subscribers. So anytime that I came out with a new collection, um, I really didn't really have to run much ads to sell out through mm. that collection. Uh, that's one thing that I will say is that in the beginning, we were super duper scrappy, like from the yep. very beginning. Um, and then once we identified, okay, what's working and what's not working, it became a shift in mindset in terms of, um, let's not, you know, diversify so quickly in SKU count, but let's diversify in um, the products that are selling, right? Mm -hmm. So meaning if I had a blanket or a romper and those sold really well, now I'm just going to add two or three different patterns to see if mm. we can expand on that specific cut, you know, uh, to make sure that we maintain our costs, but also we were very confident knowing, you know, going in that uh, this product would sell. So we right. saved a lot. Um, being very lean and understanding what our moms wanted from the very beginning. Um, and amazing. UGC. UGC was a mm. big one because, I mean, we had so many moms like sending us pictures. We actually used to have a, a cutie contest once a month. Mm. And so the goal was that like all the moms would um, submit their, you know, photos. And um, we had a disclaimer that if you 
did submit your photo, we were able to use it across our social media pages and our website and, you know, for ads. And so um, they would tag, we would make them tag their friends and family to vote for their child's photo. Um, And so the one with the most votes obviously got a gift card to spend on our website. So not only did that bring in a ton of engagement for Mm -hmm. us, um, built our following very quickly. We had like over, I don't know, 300,000, uh, 300,000 followers, um, uh, between Facebook and Instagram. And, uh, that really propelled our growth. So there was a few things in there. Yeah. It's really interesting. Like just the, I mean, I think you said it perfectly, like the scrappy nature of bootstrapping. So scrappy. Yeah. And you have to think outside the box and, you know, we deal with like VC back companies who are just like paid, 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 paid media everywhere. Um, and then I actually spoke with a founder last week who was like, man, we just didn't have the capital to do Facebook ads at a minimum of five, 10 K a month. He was like, I went knocking on local retailers, independent retailers and who are now selling the products. And he's like, that accounts for 55 to 60% of our gross revenue. And it didn't, he's like, and guess how much it costs? Zero dollars, you know? And so I think for, for everybody, we get caught and especially us now in digital marketing, like, well, this budget and these CPMs and these cost per clicks and new client acquisition costs, but for the, the scrappy bootstrap it, there are so many other ways to get your brand out there. Absolutely. That's that's awesome. Very interesting. And from a product development standpoint too, I think Mm. it's very important to hit on that too, because I find now working with a lot of brands that, um, especially in the fashion industry, like you get in the habit, these founders get in the habit of buying what they think might sell or what they think is cute or what looks good on them. And let me tell you, that is a recipe for disaster. Like when I first started Castle Rose, I really was like, oh my God, I love this print. I'm going to get it. I like it on my daughter and all that stuff. And then I quickly had to understand that it's not what I want. It's what my people want. And that's right. a, like a huge shift in mindset for someone that's a visionary and a creator by nature, because a lot of times you get hung up on what your vision is and you don't yep. put your actual consumer on the front end. Um, and so um, we we quickly made that realization very early on that I don't like at the end of the day, it didn't matter to me what I thought of the print. If it's sold, right. who cares? Like that's right. what we're going to push, you know? Yep. It's so funny because we have a we have a client, great company, and they're doing fantastic, but they are hugely interested in increasing their SKUs. And mm-hmm. it's like going back to the vision or the mission, you know, are these going to sell? And when you're talking about certain inventory and new production and manufacturing, and maybe we can dive into this, that is an expensive endeavor. Super expensive. Without yes. yet that proof of sale. And so understanding the manufacturing side of things becomes really important as you start to scale. Is it worth that $50,000 investment into new SKUs when you can take that $50,000 and and replicate based on what your target audience is already buying? Absolutely. I think that's where a lot of people get super hung up on, you know, the way that they have to grow. They have to have new arrivals every week or they have to have new collection drops every month, you know, and I'm just like, it's overcomplicating the process, to be honest. Like if you really strip everything away, you have core products that are hero products. And as long as you never run out of those, you can really have a very successful business. Without a doubt. And it's, it's, I don't remember who did it, but it's the 80, 20 rule. And it Mm -hmm. applies to so many businesses, basically every business that I've seen. And that 80% of the revenue comes from 20%. And it's making sure to remember that. Um, Before we hop into what you're doing now, um, I have a question that's just kind of yearning. Do you think if it wasn't for COVID, you would have had continued on the e-commerce journey? Oh, I get people to ask me this all the time, or will I start another brand? Mm. Um, I don't think so. I think I was kind of already consulting and I was already dabbling into some other brands. You know, my problem, and this is something that I haven't shared with a lot of people that um, the struggle that we had with our business um, when we were operating at that time is that our average order value was so low. 
Mm. Um, it was about 50, it was hovering about $55 and $60 yeah. around there. Um, and as acquisition costs continue to rise, um, yeah. you know, it's, it's very hard to financially maintain, um, the demand and also, you know, the acquisition side, we have very, very strong LTV. So I was pretty confident that we would make the money back anyway, yeah. but you know, when you're in that predicament and you're running off of cash flow to keep the business alive every month. I mean, you know, this, it's very, yep. very difficult to, you know, continue down that path without actual, um, good capital. You know and I mean? Right. Good capital by not like merchant cash advances or any of these crappy lenders that are out there stay yep. away because <laughs> they're <laughs> the worst. Yep. Um, and so it just became increasingly difficult. So for us, I think that one of the things that happened that if I were to do it all over again, I would have preferred a much more slower, sustainable growth so that mm -hmm. I can keep up with that demand um, yep. to shoot from, you know, nothing to 1.7 was yep. very aggressive. And what um, was that time frame? 18 months. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So I think that, yeah, we got to the point where, and we had some investors like really, you know, interested in buying us out and all that stuff. But um, I had a warehouse and I had yep. a team. And so they were not interested in buying a warehouse. They wanted everything right. streamlined. And at the time, yep. you know, 3PLs weren't really like that big and they were very costly and they still are. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah, it was just a, a good time for me to kind of transition anyway. Yep. The pivot was there. Yeah, it's interesting. So one of the things that when you and I connected, it was clear that we both kind of nerded out on the numbers and the true uh, KPIs that really matter for e-commerce. Mm -hmm. And I know we haven't dove into it yet because I think the intro of you know how you got to where you are now is super critical to knowing those KPIs. Yes. Um, why don't you dive into a little bit about what you're doing now and then we can nerd out together again. Yeah, yeah. So now I um, own a Area 6, which is an agency. Um, we specialize in paid social UGC for um, fashion brands, um, D2C fashion brands. And um, during this process, obviously, you know, I have the background and the knowledge of owning the e-com brand, which I don't think if it were for me not having that, you know, I wouldn't be as successful as I am today. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, so we just help brands now that are anywhere from startups or a lot of them are like um, in wholesale primarily and they want to tap into the DC space. Um, and so we've taken anywhere from, you know, someone that hasn't spent any money to, you know, someone that's spending half a million dollars a month. So, yeah. um, but we definitely specialize in fashion just because it comes really natural to me. Um, I understand logistics. I understand the operations side of things, the product development. I get involved with our clients in terms of buying, um, you know, submitting PO orders, like forecasting, you know, um, you know, inventory restocks and that sort of stuff. So it's just, kind of, it's like second nature to me. Yeah, that's perfect. I think, and I, I, these conversations always lead from what I am kind of going through right now with certain accounts or, or prospects and I think the interesting thing and in when you and I have connected is your immense understanding of that forecasting and inventory mm -hmm. and all of that. One of the issues that uh, a client is experiencing right now, and, and you hit it just a minute ago, is uh, more of a cash flow problem based on the amount of inventory available and the rate in which it's selling. Yes. So when you're going through these and you're having these conversations with clients, friends, other brand owners, like what are some of the insights that you're taking into consideration to alleviate that problem? Yeah, I don't think there's a way that we can alleviate the problem, to be honest. I think if we understand that any business, it doesn't matter what niche you're in, um, you're always going to be in some sort of debt. The difference mm -hmm. with fashion or with, you know, what we do is that you can take more calculated risks if you actually understand your data. It goes back to like the basic fundamentals. Like when we had our own boutique, we would like, you know, ask our followers, like, what pattern do you like? 
Is it this yeah. one or this one? Do you like this romper? Do you like this dress? You know, surveying them, you know, sending them emails, you know, um, having restock, you know, options on your website. So you know how much inventory you need to buy. I think yeah. that um, some of that gets missed because again, we're just trying to follow this vision of, you know, what this brand needs to look like. And so a lot of mistakes get made during that process that costs a lot of money. Yep. Um, and I think if we just like analyze what we currently sell, what's in stock and find those five, let's say five hero products that do very, very well and keep doubling down on those and the rest, you can sprinkle in new arrivals and, you know, new drops here and there, but you could really build a sustainable business if you have understanding of what your people want, um, and making sure that you can replenish. Yeah. Yeah, it's we've we've tried to establish like the rate of purchases and, and you know, you have those random months. I mean, obviously we're it's February twenty four right now. Mm. We just came off of Q four, so like it's sales wild. numbers are so drastic yeah. from year over year trends. Mm. Um, but I think it's really important to, like you just said, keep track of what's actually selling frequently and then yeah. at what rate are they selling? And then you can kind of annualize the forecast from there um, yeah. is really important. So you don't potentially yeah. get stuck with a million dollars of inventory. That is exactly. just such a cash flow problem. Yeah. Another cool hack um, that we started doing is if you go and um, go to Shopify and you filter out your customers that have bought at least three times, you know, within mm -hmm. a year um, and you see what their first initial purchase was, what brought them to your store to convert um, that gives you a lot of insights too, because oftentimes brands are like, oh, well, this product didn't really do that well, you know, and they'll discontinue it. But if you find that there's data supporting that, that actual product brought in a strong LTV, um, mm -hmm. then chances are that you need to keep that product. You know, it may not scream that it's a hero product, but if that person, if that product is bringing in more people that are buying from you three to five times a year. I would make sure that that product is always replenished. Remember that tag, whatever timestamp this is, because that's definitely <laughs> the pro hack of the day. Yeah. And it's interesting. Like we're, we're just, we're going through a prospect account right now and average order values, low price points, low margins, really good. And it was just interesting. The volume of revenue coming through, um, we're talking six figure months based yeah. on, you know, literally a $20 AOV and the MER was actually fantastic. You're like, wow, this guy, you know, he really has something here. Um, and going through the, the initial purchase, that small price point, and then people were buying all the bundles. Yep. And so like that, Although that initial purchase is twelve dollars, at the end of the yeah. day, the bundles come in, and then exactly you lose money on the first yeah. one. So it becomes a this business strategy of LTV. well, how can we? Yep. And are you? Do you have enough positive cash flow to support the initial loss, knowing that in sixty days you're recouping there on out? And that's what I mean about calculated risk right there. Yep. That's the, the prime example of what a calculated risk is. If you know, because you have supporting data that you can mm -hmm. buy $50,000 worth of those units and they are going to sell within a three months time frame or six months, like that's information that is so important to know. Yep. And most people don't have the slightest clue. They're just right. like running out of whim. And that's where businesses fail. Yeah. And I think it's really interesting. I was actually thinking last night about e-commerce and we used to do lead generation for local businesses. We used to do all these other types of businesses over the last three years. We just do e-commerce because it almost reduces out a number of the other variables, yeah. right? There's so much data backed in the e-commerce world, separate from lead gen where you have the sales guy and the closing yes. and this and the job. And there were so many other things out of our control if you know this industry, you're able to know insights like you and I are sharing today um, that are super important for e-com brands. Yeah, there's just so much data out there. Like, you, you know, it's, it's if you really just sat down and I know it's hard because as a founder, you have so many hats. And especially if you're in the beginning, like you have you're basically just trying to stay above water. It's impossible mm -hmm. for you to take the time and like really analyze this data. But that's why having the right partner 
or someone, yep. a mentor. I had a mentor when I was running my my brand. His name was Ed. Shout out to Ed if you're listening. Um, you know, you just have to have somebody helping you understand so that you make less, you know, um, mistakes at the end of the yep. day. That's that's the name of the game. Yeah, it's it's. So it's, it's really important. I think you and I connected at a conference where we're going to learn from others, right? So I, I think you hit the nail on the head. For people who are like, wow, these two are talking just nonsense right now. Like what would be some of those KPIs or reports in the Shopify platform that you would just pull kind of as a starting point to understand the financial side of, of their business? Yeah. So we actually build a PNL for all of our brands. That's like the first thing that we do and actually in the audit process. Um, so what I do is the PNL will export all of the monthly revenue mm -hmm. um, after returns. That's obviously you don't want to factor in returns in there. And then we pull all the data across whatever channels they pay, you know, for advertising on. Um, yep. And that's how we calculate uh, their MER. MER is marketing efficiency ratio. For those of you that don't know, um, it's a basic formula, Shopify revenue divided by total ad spend. That's our North Star metric. Uh, without knowing um, any more details is where it gets tricky. So um, you have to have a basic understanding of what your OPEX are. So like, what is your operational expenditures? It doesn't have to be perfect, but if you don't know what those numbers are, my team and I, we're going in blind. So we're going to assume a 5X MER is great, and we're just going to keep scaling to the moon. And yep. in reality, you should have been hitting a 6 or a yep. 7. You know what I mean? Yep. Like we need to have visibility on those numbers. And you have to have really good margins. So you have to have a decent margin, especially now, back when I first started, I mean, like you could probably get away with, you know, a 50% margin or a 45% margin. But now, honestly, if you're under 65, it is incredibly more difficult for you to bring your acquisition costs down unless you have a strong LTV. Right. Um, so we pull a lot of things. We're looking at all the finances, uh, from, you know, ac the acquisition side, how meta is performing, uh, what's your cost per acquisition on meta, you know, what are we seeing in terms of, you know, um, your retention strategy, what's the percentage of return, you know, customers that are coming back. That's a huge one. It should be 30%, um, any yep. less than 30%, you're going to be having a hard time. Yep. Um, 30% of your retention, you know, your revenue should be coming from email, SMS. Um, and so uh, those are all sort of some of the factors that we look at before we do a deep dive in the inventory. Yeah, that's awesome. It's, it's interesting. Uh, obviously, you, you and I don't know how our businesses work, but the framework's the same, right? It's just a yeah. super dumbed down P&L. Um, yeah. Even to the point, and we've talked to people who have either just purchased a store and they're still doing, you know, their own business part-time. And even in those OPEX, it's like, what's rent? What is, even if you don't have it yet, right? Still yeah. trying to paint the goal of what you're trying to accomplish. What is the salary you need in order to quit your day job and turn this idea into a dream or an actual thing? Uh, so it's taking that into consideration. And then that gives that MER um, really interesting. I think, I believe the Shopify dashboard in analytics, you know, when you just log into your home dashboard, the total sales, I think the pre-calculated number does exclude return Returns. orders. Yes, so, that's you know, for anybody who's listening, who's like, man, LTV, lifetime value, MER, how do I even start? Just go to your dashboard. You look at your total sales there. Then what did you spend? You know, yeah. and that's your MER. From there... You can talk to somebody like either of us, or I'm sure you find it on Google, simplified PL. Doesn't mean your phone, doesn't mean all these things. It's just like we have six rows of different expenses that we want to include in as operating expenses to paint that picture of like the sustainability of the business. Uh, and those are really, really important. Yeah, absolutely. I think to your point, like the shift from pre iOS update to now has become such a more pivotal um shift into the finances of the business opposed to like your ROAS is at a 10 this is the best thing ever like 
it you know that's part of our discovery call now is like yeah. what are your cogs and remember cogs need to be cost of goods for you to purchase as well as shipping costs merchant fees credit card processing fees all of those things need to be in account for your cogs. It's not just how much did you pay for the product? It's how much does it actually cost you to fulfill the delivery of product to a customer? That is your margin. Exactly. Yeah. So let's shift a little bit into what we're seeing for trends. Um, obviously, we all know, like, we're in a space that evolves like crazy. We're not yeah. like roofing companies that just lay shingles like this industry with technology advancing so rapidly. Um, what are you seeing for the most important factors for e-com brands to start growing? Ooh, that's a lot. Um, I think that more and more people are uh, more aware of the current economic state and how it's mm -hmm. affecting their household than they were even six months ago. Yep. Um, that becomes a challenge for a Lux brand, for example, who wants to stay at a certain AOV. I think that there has to be, I, I mean, I'm forecasting or I'm thinking ahead that there has to be um, uh, an area where if we want to ride this way of, of 2024 and so forth, because we really don't know with elections coming up, we don't know what it's going to look like. Um, we need to start thinking about how we can offer a more accessible uh, product to the general market. Um, mm -hmm. So maybe that's a different collection. Maybe that's a collection that's a little bit, you know, um, less expensive. You know, yep. we have to get really creative. There's brands that are adamant that have been in this space for 10 plus years. And they're like, absolutely not. We are not that. We're not that brand. But Unfortunately, if you don't have innovation and if you don't have anything different or something more accessible to the, the current market that we are in, you're going to struggle a yeah. lot. It's interesting because I, I have a couple brands that I, you know, I purchase from all the time and I've seen their frequency of offers increasing already. You have to. You know, yeah. like, like my t-shirts, I rock them every day. Shout out to Built Basics. Uh, the text messages I'm getting now every other day is just way more than over the last couple of years. Yeah. And so then I think going back to like your scrappy nature and bootstrapping your e-com brand, what are some of the things that you are implementing for, you know, you have the kind of fashion focused uh, marketing. What are some of the things that you guys are integrating into your strategies for, for the brands? So you mean like trends? What exactly? Yeah. What are, what are some of the things that are kind of like the bedrock or the evergreen nature of still driving success for the brands you're working with? I think honestly, it's just been like, uh, I'm in the fashion. So I talk a lot about fashion here. It's just trying to stay ahead of the trend as much as possible. Um, mm -hmm. And what that might be mean is, you know, if we typically launch a collection, um, you know, for spring or summer, you know, in the month of April, for example, mm -hmm. maybe we need to do it sooner, you know, yep. and just like kind of testing out how we can get our product out there in a more cost effective way. That's yep. one. The other thing I hit on before is just making sure that we are taking more calculated risks now more than ever. Right. And so we have set up things like post-purchase surveys, like no using no commerce or sending surveys out to your existing, um, you know, customer base and just understanding what it is that they want to see for the future collection so mm -hmm. that we aren't really like wasting, you know, money on things that we don't know if they're actually going to sell or not. Right. Um, I'm collecting things like colors, you know, different textiles and patterns and just like trying to understand, okay, what could, what other product could we come out with that same pattern, you know, and mm -hmm. just trying to save there. Um, you know, there's just a lot of things that we have to just, it's, it's very different now than it, what, you know, yeah. what it used to be. It's, it's, you really, and with fashion, unfortunately, um, it is subjective. And so right. we, we really do have to understand what the market wants at all times. And then I think that it's also important to 
um, diversify as much as you can. I mean, um, most brands that I work with have never heard of things like um, common sold, or they're not even on TikTok shops, or, you know, they're not utilizing Instagram lives, you know, and there's just like so many ways that you can get your products physically into other consumers hands without having to buy them every single time. Right. And so I think that you're just going to have to you know, we have to understand that that's just the name of the game. Now we have to try other things to get in front of them. Yeah. And luckily we're in a time where there are a ton of other things. Uh, You mentioned TikTok shops. We haven't gone that route with any client yet. Uh, We, our clients actually have pushed back slightly because of the amount of privacy um, in for private information that you have to give to TikTok to even be on the shops page. Um, we're seeing from a paid media side, I mean, Advantage Plus shopping, Instagram shops, Facebook shops, absolutely crushing right now. Um, how many of the brands that you're working with right now have a face to the brand? Um, and I'll lead the question with why I'm asking in that we have certain accounts and I know certain brand founders who are the face and they're able to bring such a personality to it mm-hmm. opposed to we work with other brands who don't have that face. And so they find it extremely troublesome to have that personality conveyed into their, their kind of what they're representing. Yeah, that's a good one. I, I have right now like three brands that have a founder's face to the brand. Mm-hmm. Um, and I will tell you, they are performing the best. Um, yeah. I think that you you actually opened up a whole can of worms here because that's another thing that's shifting in the current um, marketing, digital marketing space as I'm seeing it too. Like we used to run a lot of UGC and now UGC is slowly not becoming as good before because right. people are starting to pick up on like, okay, yeah. we know that you're paying this person to like run right. this, you know? Um, so it's not as authentic as it used to be. Um, and so, um, having founder, a founder space on camera, uh, it just works wonders. Like now they can actually feel, um, trust and build trust with that person. Um, especially if they're still very much in it, like picking and packing the orders and they're answering customer service and comments and stuff like that. Like, I think that's, it, it is performing really, really well for us now. Yeah, we, we're seeing the same thing. It's interesting. I thought UGC would have started to taper off before now, but it still seems to be a powerhouse that it people are works. looking for. Mm-hmm. So works. what would your recommendation be like for then the, the you have three um, founder-led brands, and then I'm sure you have a number of ones that don't. What are some of the insights or tips you could give to somebody who maybe still has a full-time job and they're like, I can't be the face what would some of the things that you would suggest for them to do to still have a personality i think it starts off just baby steps you know providing one video of just breaking down like why did you initiate this brand to begin with what made you so compelled to start this brand you you'd be surprised how far that one video will go you know especially like retargeting or something like that Um, and then, you know, I, I think at the end of the day is like, you have to ask yourself, like, what do I prioritize in my business and start removing things that aren't bringing in more community, um, and start prioritizing these things because this is what's important is, you know, is making sure that, um, that you get in front of your audience and, you know, you get people to build trust in your brand, especially, The brands that are coming out now, whew, like it is, it is tough to build a yeah. brand right now. I think it was a lot easier a couple of years ago, post iOS, you know, uh, pre iOS 14. And, you know, during the COVID times, there's so many brands that came out and they were just crushing. But if you're starting out now, the easiest way, and I did this, you know, plenty of times with my, with my store and my shop is I got in front of that camera. We did lives quite often. We would just introduce a new sale. We would introduce a new collection, talk about it. It doesn't have to be overcomplicated. Like it really right. doesn't. I was just talking to a founder yesterday and she's like, well, I need to set up the thing and I need to make it professional no. and set up the studio. And you're like, no, you just need to start. <laughs> just you grab just your phone and just start right. recording. <laughs> yep. 
Um, so on the paid media side, we were actually sending Instagram messages last night about things just to quickly, we have a few minutes left. Um, I know both of us are heavy into Facebook and Instagram advertising on the paid media side. Um, you mentioned UGC content. What are some of the different creative assets that you're seeing just on a macro level performing? So if somebody is like, Hey, I have a hundred dollars a day to spend and I'm still bootstrapping it myself, um, testing creatives. What are some of the things that you're seeing to be more effective than others right now? Yeah. So, um, us versus them, um, Mm. is definitely crushing for us right now. I think that it goes back to like what we were talking about earlier when there's so much noise now on social media and so many brands that are selling the same product. Um, it makes sense why us versus them is crushing it. Um, we have some us versus them videos that are absolutely destroying it for an athleisure brand right now. Um, so that's a big one that's, um, underutilized, um, for textiles and patterns zoomed in. So if you simply Mm -hmm. just take in a split of the image on, whether that be a ghost, you know, mannequin or it on a lifestyle image and then zooming in on the right side to the actual pattern so they can actually see it on screen. That one for fashion is a big one that's not utilized. Um, Carousels, uh, it's a quick way to just kind of scan through three or four slides. If you didn't like the first one, you might like the third one. I think that's a huge one um, that is underutilized. And um, the other one that I really like is just, uh, we call mashups. Um, Mashups is a, a combination of your lifestyle footage versus um, UGC and you kind of just mix, you know, the both with B-roll and uh, those do really, really well. Cause sometimes UGC just completely flops and then like yeah. the brand's like, ah, we're not going to use it anymore. We've actually recycled right. that same UGC video multiple times. That's really awesome. Those are insight, great insights. It's, we think we are huge fans of content repurposing as well. Uh, yeah. You know, if it's there, it might have not worked in the format that it was presented initially, but you can do so much more with things. Yeah, Um, we've made this might not be completely applicable to fashion, but identifying what your initial value prop is and then putting that at the very top of the image. So like this is the last pair of X you'll ever need. And there's just like that thumb stopper as well as then highlighting the benefits within the product photo we're seeing that crushing it. I said it a couple of weeks ago in another episode, like we have a high, high level uh, celebrity on one of our ads for a client. And that is actually beating out this high level celebrity that literally the entire world knows about the, this is the last pair of X you will ever need is beating that out. Um, And it was created on Canva in like 30 (laughs) minutes. So (laughs) for for scrappy bootstrap businesses like there are so many ways like you said figure out the different platforms figure out the different options you have um and there the internet is ripe with scrappy ideas to test out absolutely there's so much information out there if you don't um use you know if you don't have the funds to like hire an agency for play is available to the public you can sign up for for play and take a look at all of the different ads and designs that are across multiple facebook and instagram brands magic brief is another really great one they're both super affordable i think i pay i don't know 49 dollars a month for it. So mm-hmm. there's a lot of different ways um, that you can find designs that will work for your brand. And value prop, even with fashion, can still be done. Like it, oh, yeah. it is definitely something that you can still be, um, that you can still utilize if you have uh, certain designs or certain fabrics, you know, things that really stand out. Yep. And I think the missed opportunity a lot of people don't actually even know about is the Facebook ads library. Since mm-hmm all of the privacy stuff like they had to become more transparent and you can literally look at any ad from any brand that are running ads and go through all of them and my my pro tip for the day is go to the bottom ones that are still running that were launched march 2023 if they are still running they are working absolutely that's a good one yeah so uh as we wrap up we're coming close to the 45 minute mark 
what are what's the last kind of insights that you can give to somebody who's like man i really just want to grow the store i want to be with my kids more i want to you know achieve whatever their goal is for life with their brand um what would you say is like the most important step for them to take yeah this is something that i preach um across everyone that i speak to for the most part is that you have to first understand that no matter what business you are in or what you sell you are in the business of marketing first Mm. Um, you have to put that hat on and you have to think every time you pick a product, every time you design something, every time you think of a change on your website or put something on Instagram, like you have to think of how that is going to bring you in money. And so if you change that mentality, things will start to click for you and make sense. Um, and so that's, that's the first thing that I would do. The, the second thing is if you're just starting out, if you're spending less than $5,000 a month on ad spend, do not hire an agency. Um, I don't care if there's anyone out there that could tell you I'll do it for a thousand bucks or whatever. Like you need to learn yourself. You need to get in yeah. there, understand the back end of Facebook and Instagram, see how it works. There's plenty of YouTube, you know, videos and courses that you can apply for so that you understand. So when you are ready to hire an agency, you understand what's happening in your ad account and you, yep. you know, can hold them accountable. That's, that's the first thing. Yep. Um, and, and having a cadence, um, you know, making sure that you have a cadence for content um, and making sure that you have a marketing calendar in place. Um, so that everyone on your team, whether that just be you or someone that you hired, you know, to, to help you internally, like there has to be cohesion across the board and everyone has to be working towards that common goal. Um, and, and don't be afraid of setting like really audacious goals. I think at the end of the day, like what, I mean, you really have to set revenue goals that make sense for your finances, you know, get those operational expenditures ironed out know what your margins are. And then everything starts to like look very clear to you. You know that you have fixed costs that you absolutely have to maintain to keep the lights on. And then anything after that is like, okay, this could help me with expanding my inventory. This will help me expand, you know, um, you know, spend more marketing or whatever that is. You have to understand your finances. If you don't know your numbers, you are just, you're, you're going to set yourself up to fail. Yep. I couldn't agree more. And those are fantastic insights. Um, Angie, before we wrap this up, where can people find you? Where can they check out your website, your Instagram? Give us the whole rundown. Yeah. So I am on Instagram at Angie Petiti, P-E-T-I-T-T-I. Give me a T. No, kidding. <laughs> um, and um, my agency is called Area 6. Uh, so that's area6marketing.com uh, or area6.com. Um, and yeah, just if you ever have just questions about anything fashion related, jewelry, kids, all the things, um, I'm here. Awesome. And that's area six with the number not spelt out. We'll leave all the information in the show notes below. Uh, Angie, as always, it's been amazing speaking with you today. Just amazing insights. I hope everyone got as much value out of this as I did. Thanks for coming on today. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. And we'll see you guys in the next episode.